ओके आई गेस यू आर गुड टू गो वेलकम मानव All right. Thank you, Monet. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, it is a pleasure to have you. Uh, uh, I welcome all the participants who are joining us from across length and breadth of this country and abroad uh, to join this webinar on uh, on a very very interesting topic: uh, the global trends in IT post COVID. How IT is going to fare for all of us? That is something that is very very important, and we all need to uh, take a stock of it. Uh, also i would like to introduce today to my esteemed panelist who is amongst us to shed some light on these aspects that i'll i shall be taking him through and he shall be shedding uh, of his knowledge on that and uh, <clears throat> mr manav is currently working as vice president at sap ariba usa is based out of usa currently and in past he, he was working with the oracle which was uh, which was earlier some part of oracle which is now consumed into it was earlier known as sun microsystems so he has been working in us from uh, for quite long now and uh, he started his journey as a lead developer in one of the companies called as tidal software here in india and from where he shifted to us and then he has moved through ranks and right now he is at an illustrious position of vice president of product and engineering at sap ariba uh i once again welcome you manav and uh, <clears throat> about me i am uh, monit kapoor i head department of cybernetics over here uh, in school of computer science i am here uh, in this university since last 9 uh, years now we offer various uh, specialization programs in the area of cloud devops open source artificial intelligence big data iot blockchain you name it you name the technology we have all the technologies that are there In the digital transformation space, we all offer these programs in addition to the B Tech CSC and uh, the second part, which is specialization, for example, big data or DevOps. And uh, UPS happens to be a domain-focused university, and all our programs are known for specialization. And we are no different. School of Computer Sciences offers on the cutting edge of the technologies with lots of impetus on domain-specific and fundamental and core skills to our graduating students. Uh, Uh, we started uh, school of computer science uh, way back in 2011 in 2009 and uh, from 2011 we entered into uh, mous with companies like ibm from where we started our journey with small number of four program and 180 students right now we are offering 15 different specialization we got three different uh, academic partners who are with us in these in this journey ibm being the first one later to join was zebia with which we started big data and devops and latest one has been oracle uh, which has uh, which has offered with which we offer bca programs in the domain of internet of things and banking and financial services and insurance so mano welcome again and uh, uh, you know uh, off late we are seeing that uh, there is a lot of digital transformation that is catching up across disciplines and across industries you know and digital transformation has made few things uh, very very evident that uh, we were already talking about industry 4.0 and digital transformation has kind of made uh, this transition from less digital to more digital uh, it has it has given a thorough impetus and an acceleration and industry 4.0 also uh, promises uh, many disciplines like artificial intelligence and blockchain and uh, digital transformation is primarily hinging on domains like cloud and devops and other uh, big data and other technologies so uh i would request you to please uh, shed some light on uh, what set of skills uh, a computer graduate would need to be successful in these work work workspaces of future in which uh, lots of digital transformation and industry 4.0 is going to happen that's an excellent question monit uh so i think one of the major things that when we talk about artificial intelligence uh one of the major things that uh we need to keep in mind is uh people mix up artificial intelligence and machine learning yeah uh when you about machine learning machine learning uh, as you already know it has uh, you know there's supervised machine learning unsupervised uh, machine learning reinforced machine learning so i, I think right now in the industry the way uh the way we are solving the problem most of it is supervised 
uh, there are companies, uh, there are big organizations that are doing a lot of unsupervised and reinforced learning as well. But the main focus is right now supervised learning. And there are tons of frameworks out there uh, that, that allow you to do supervised learning. TensorFlow is one of them, DL4J uh, is another one, uh, Deep Learning for Java. Uh, AWS has uh, MXNet, Guleon, and so on and so forth. I think your question was pertaining to, hey, what are the skill sets that are needed for, for graduating students to be successful? Yeah. For graduate students to be successful, I think basically they, they need to have a solid foundation in programming, that's a given. And then they need to start familiarizing them with, uh, with one of these frameworks, whether, whether you pick TensorFlow, whether you pick DL4J, whether you pick uh, MXNet or Guleon, uh, pick a framework that you are very, very comfortable with, uh, learn about it, right? Uh, now, there, is, there are two aspects to that. One is essentially data gathering, uh, data cleansing, and then building models out of it. And the second portion of it is, hey, how do you do inference, uh, inference using those models? Uh, the third aspect of it is how do you build these pipelines? Uh, how do you build pipelines to, to be able to build models, uh, both on structured and unstructured data? How do you build using those pipelines uh, uh, for your data scientists that allow you to build models? How do you push that stuff into production? Uh, then once it is in production, how do, how do you do inferences? Are you doing batch inferencing uh, of the data? Are you doing runtime inferencing of the data? So people need to be familiar with, again, various frameworks that allow you to do this stuff. How do you use those frameworks to productionalize your uh, uh, machine learning uh, models and put it, push it into production? So that, is, that goes back to uh, DevOps, and then uh, how do you do inference, and how do you how how do you do scalability? So there are a lot of uh, aspects that uh, graduate students need to be familiar with in order for them to be able to be successful, uh, not just in artificial uh, in machine learning uh, and IoT, but there are a lot of uh, whole slew of subjects that, that you need to be familiar with. Uh, machine learning, DevOps, uh, scaling. Uh, so these are the things that I would recommend uh, your students focus on uh, when they're looking for opportunities in the market. When you're mentioning scaling, Manav, uh, so yes. is, that, is that you're talking about how to get more out of IT infrastructure, how to adopt cloud? Is that what specifically you are speaking about? Uh, when I talk about scaling, scaling also uh, can mean various things uh, to various folks, right? So, for example, uh, let's we were talking about machine learning. So let's just take that particular topic. So machine learning, uh, you can, based upon the data set that you have, you can use uh, a particular framework to build a model. Now, uh, it all depends upon the hardware you, do, you have, for example, to be able to build that model. Are, do you have uh, one GPU capacity uh, or for, forget GPUs, people are trying to build models using uh, just compute machine, CPUs. Uh, a CPU, single uh, CPU might take you uh, say uh, 20 days to build a model. A GPU might take a week. Uh, how many GPUs do you need to be able to build models and do iterations on models very, very quickly? So that is one piece of scale. Uh, that is the model building stuff. Now at the inference time, what inference time? Are you doing inference uh, as a batch process or are you doing inference as a runtime process? If you're doing inference as a runtime process, you want millisecond responses. Now, imagine the number of requests, imagine number of Google searches people are doing, and imagine if you have to, if there is a learning model and if you're doing inference at runtime, uh, 
what what is the traffic that that your uh, that your service is getting how do you scale that traffic how do you do the distribution of the traffic that is coming uh, companies like facebook amazon sap uh, when you deploy products the um, the scale at which you need to work at is is uh, millions and millions of requests per second so how do you handle that uh, uh, at, at the web server level how do you translate that in uh, at the application server level how do you distribute the, these requests out assuming each request is asking for some uh, machine learning data there might be multiple models that you're mixing uh, in order for you to do in, inferences and give uh, give the end user a particular result so when i talk about scaling scaling can be both uh, from ground up as hey what databases you are using uh, you know what are you using for your uh, machine learning model creation what are you using for uh, inferences how are you handling the uh, requests at an application server level how do you handle requests at the load balancer that is uh, uh, that is in front of uh, front uh, managing your traffic and uh, distributing out the load so when i talk about scaling it it it's not just one particular aspect it is all aspects right because uh, uh, because in the end it all boils down to you are as fast as the weakest weakest link in the chain so hope that helps yeah uh, thoroughly explained thank you manav for that and you would be glad to know that uh, uh, when we we are offering a program in artificial intelligence and machine learning where we are covering all aspects of machine learning that you just spoke about and similarly when we talk about a program like devops that we are offering so in that we are doing a lot of uh, stuff on application containerization and orchestration so all the tools and technologies that are currently famous like kts and docker uh, docker of the world we are covering them in devops program and similarly for cloud computing students also a lot of opportunities happening where they tend to learn various technology stacks which are available on amazon off the shelf uh, on various other cloud platforms like microsoft and google so yeah. having said that uh, manav so these skills are definitely very very uh, important like you need to know what is cloud and artificial intelligence and devops to succeed in a digital transformation world but there are certainly there is a lot of emphasis and importance on the core fundamentals like problem solving and critical thinking and algorithmic thinking so uh, what are the what are the particular core fundamentals other than that i mentioned that you normally look at when young graduates for various projects are being hired <clears throat> for your company or a company like yours for example in us you you must be seeing the overall landscape how the hiring is taking uh, space and as we know that we are moving towards a skill based hiring model also so what are the core fundamentals that still one needs to have uh, to succeed in that kind of a hiring environment in a global space so uh, i'll i'll cover that question in in two aspects one is one is essentially hey what are the technical aspects that are needed and the second set is is the soft skills okay so let's let's talk about uh, what are the fundamentals so i think in the industry we already covered ai ml the second portion of the problem is hey uh, everybody wants a very slick and uh, very fast uh, uh, and intuitive user interface so user experience is another side of the uh, puzzle the fundamentals in both these are person needs to be able to think 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 very logically through the problem so i think uh problem solving uh algorithms data structures uh uh pipelines uh these are the things uh you should be very very familiar with pick one language and get familiar with that that language through and through because once you start getting familiar with one language uh it allows you to to be able to learn about all the aspects uh uh and try and solve the problem with one particular language uh, of all the problems that we discussed hey how do you do scaling how do you do threading how do you do uh, how do you do memory management so once you learn that with one particular language and you will get exposed to things like the the, the implicit assumption is you will get uh, exposed to things like uh, data structures uh, complex algorithms 
uh, 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 so algorithms, data structures, uh, getting familiar with the syntax of a, a programming language, those are, those are the skills that we, we seek during our interview process. Uh, the second part of the uh, skill set that we do focus on, we look at uh, whether the person, whether the candidate is a very fast learner, uh, they have a right attitude, are they team player, are they curious, uh, when, when, uh, when we interview somebody, one of my questions that I ask is, hey, what do you do in your free time? I think that tells a person, uh, at least me, a lot about what, what are their passion, what are they passionate about? Right? How do they friend, uh, spend their free time? Are they curious? Uh, and it does not matter whether they're doing programming or anything. Are they passionate about anything in life? Yeah. Uh, communication is another one. Uh, with we, uh, with the COVID situation and uh, with the way the development of open software was happening, communication is happening uh, more and more remote. Hence, communication skills are one of the top skills that we look for. Uh, so these are the areas that I would say we look for when, when we look at a candidate and try to bring them on board. Wow. Thank you so much. Uh, that is so re-comforting again, Manav. You know, uh, we have a thorough module uh, called as a, we call it as edge program under which we start uh, teaching these softer aspects right from semester one, where uh, we are doing lots of communication skills, subjects, as well as workshops with them with trainers mm -hmm. from Dale Carnegie coming and training them on communication skills, interpersonal skills and verbal skills. And mm -hmm. then uh, we also do a lot of soft skill trainings uh, prior to the hiring cycle in our campus where trainers from various uh, soft skill companies and software skill provider companies who come and train our students on these software aspects like more. And they do a lot of group discussions and mock interviews. And we do a lot of that on soft skills. And coming to your first part of your answer, you know, uh, in our curriculum, we are doing three iterations of data structures along with labs. And uh, uh, we are doing it almost for one and a half year of first, uh, for first four years out of those first four years, also four years of the program. The first one and a half year is we are doing it thoroughly uh, with our students where we have got three iterations of data structures in our curriculum. And uh, we try to do at least three to five programming languages across the span of five years alongside the specialization aspect. If you ask me the spread of the program that we have over here is where we got like 50% of the subjects would be core computer science engineering subjects and 30%, 35% subjects are from, uh, from the area which you call as specialization. For example, if somebody's studying DevOps, so right from source code management to <clears throat> continuous integration, continuous delivery, application containerization, orchestration, test automation, so we cover the entire stack of the DevOps pipeline uh, till infrastructure, infrastructure as code is not taught to them. So that is how we proceed. And likewise for other programs. So 30% stack of the syllabus is from the, from, the, uh, from the specialization aspect and 20% is the curriculum that we attribute to uh, other departments like uh, English and uh, maths and physics and chemistry because fundamental science knowledge also has to be enhanced in order to create a good computer science engineering graduate. So point well taken and Manav, I'm, I'm really so glad that you made that point. Now, since that you have brought out COVID in this answer, and I guess we now need to hit on to the theme of our today's talk. You know, COVID has actually rattled many businesses. If you look at across <clears throat> spaces, uh, you know, a few, a few months ago, I was talking to a banking, uh, to a CEO of a banking company. So he's, he said that we are no more a bank. We are an IT company, which also does it financial products. So that is how he was explaining his business to me. And similarly, when we talk to any other space, like I was recently listening to telecom, they are also uh, in India, they are struggling for higher ARPUs and other things. So, uh, but still uh, telecom, banking and energy sector, all of these sectors, they, they are hugely requiring computing sources and they need a lot of uh, traction on various IT skills, but definitely they have changed the way they are working right now. You know, IT services and product companies, they are no different when it comes to the way the work culture is uh, getting, uh, getting changed. So what is your advice typically to the students who are starting their journey right now amidst this uncertainty? 
because lots of listeners are here today who are who are going to uh, who are here on this session or maybe on our facebook live session so who are who are going to undertake this journey of their undergraduate btech four, four years program and also there might be few listeners from my existing students set also so what would your advice to these both sets of people who are going to start their journey of their engineering program as well as the students who are going to graduate in one year to three years of time from now yeah that's an excellent question and very rele relevant in today's times uh, i think what covid has reinforced is uh, which was or already obvious to folks working in this industry was uh, the pace of digitization of services whether that is provided by the government or whether that is provided by a private sector is is accelerating and uh, i think it has uh, specifically to india with the demonetization stuff it started the uh, the the push to digitize not just the banking sector but the same kind of wave you can see in various industries uh now what given this what is what is relevant to students who are joining the industry or uh, who are just uh, you know enrolling in your programs and what is the advice for folks who are graduating i think number one irrespective of covid or not covid anybody who wants to join in the industry they need to first of all understand that learning never stops uh i guess uh monit you know this better than anybody else you have continued your learning and done your phd uh over a period of time while you were uh, uh you were providing education to the to your students as well so number one learning never stops now ability to be able to learn is a art and a skill uh that we need to be able to understand that is the most important aspect uh if you don't make learning your friend i think uh with the pace at which the industry changes uh you get outdated really really quickly so i am i'm not too sure uh in i i grew up in the indian education system as well one of the focus is most of the focus is hey let me oh i i am graduate i've graduated 10th or i've graduated 12th now the journey ends the fun starts i think what we aren't necessarily taught is that uh what we go to school for is to learn stuff such that we can apply it to problem solving in the uh, in the real world uh so number one thing is learning for us second is remote collaboration uh more and more uh, even with covid a lot of companies are uh allowing their for folks to work from home for in case of sap uh, we we've already been directed that at least in the us that we'll be working from home till uh, till the end of the year so uh remote collaboration how do you do that uh, if people if folks get familiar with that uh, really quickly uh, i think that will go a really long way i think i also hinted at communication as as a as a key uh because you are remote you need to be able you need to have have the ability to be able to communicate uh with your colleagues properly so uh do not feel i think when you are remote the one of the one of the issues that happen happens is people feel shy in reaching out don't feel shy in reaching out uh please do reach out to folks whether that uh, whether that you need help with uh any of the work situations or personal situations so start contributing to open source projects uh the more you do that uh we when we interview candidates we before even they come uh come for a on site interview or a remote interview we we look at that and we look at hey has this person active have actively been involved in the open source community and been contributing to the open source community that speaks volumes uh, uh about what a person has uh, been involved in so recommendation would be pick up programming languages uh 
start learning about how to how you can remotely contribute to any any project uh get involved with open source project as much as possible your your pull requests in github or any project speak volumes about about your work then you don't need to explain what you have learned people already know uh what your what your capabilities are so my my advice is contribute to open source figure out how to collaborate remotely uh communication is the key those those would be my takeaways wow thank you so much for iterating that you know and you will be glad to know that in some of our programs uh, like we offer a program a formal program called as computer science engineering uh, with specialization in open source software and open standards and it has been our flagship program and of late we have also started offering a program in devops and um, even in cloud computing so these are few programs in which we definitely teach the skills how to contribute to open source and uh, github is a tool of choice over here and if you ask me uh, we are uh, um, almost 70% of or 80% of my current students who are in their um, third year or fourth year all of them are operational on these tools like git and github and they do contribute and lots of contributions are going out from on github from our campus and uh, we are on their heat map uh, well said manav and thank you so much um, uh, i guess with this covid situation the prevalence of open source is even going to be more impactful for the simple reason that if you have to collaborate one has to be very very aware about the open source technologies and the issues that are there with it be it cyber security be it anything i mean if you don't know what is the problem with a particular open source solutions i mean you might plug that in into your software solution and your own own stack might actually crash so yeah. uh, thorough knowledge of open source is a is a must for the area in which one is investing his or her yeah. time into yeah Well, so monet uh, uh, uh let me ask you a question i i think we talked about like three or four different areas right devops uh sre uh we talked about ai ml and then we definitely talked about the soft skills so uh, specific to ai ml and uh, devops are there as a part of your curriculum Uh, do you guys focus on particular frameworks How, can you educate uh, both me as well as folks on on the on the call today about what what are those uh, frameworks that you guys uh, offer to your students okay i'll i'll first begin with devops uh, okay. in devops uh, we have got a layered curriculum uh, where mm-hmm. we begin you know for that matter man of any specialization program in semester 1 that is the first 6 months we do a introductory course which is just an announcement on all the subjects which are coming to the students as as part of their specialization of course 70% curriculum is same like i told you earlier all the students go to a basic computer science engineering curriculum which will comprise of data structures algorithmic thinking analysis of algorithm various programming languages databases networks and likewise so that is the bare minimum one has to go through to be a computer science engineering graduate but when it comes to specialization i'll just explain you the spread of devops we begin with a with the, something called as source code management right so in that we we tell them how to open and close pull requests like what you just mentioned and uh, the, those are part of their lab exercises they even go on to learn certain aspects of plumbing on git i mean to that extent we do they they kind of develop their own commands also so these kind of things are done then once that is done so they are very very thorough using git as a software management con- configuration management tool then we uh, then we go on to teach them linux and um, certain aspects of uh, linux scripting and other aspects right so that is a quite a detailed course if you ask me it would, it would uh, easily fetch them any second level of certification that industry offers in linux so that is the amount of curriculum that is being covered over so from the sre perspective then uh, we go on to teach them uh, something as uh, something as uh, called that is called as uh, build and release management where we teach them test driven development uh, so that they understand how to create clean code so clean coding principles start taking a shape uh, around that part because most of the programming languages would have been covered by that time and after that uh, we are doing um test automation with them where tools uh, various open source tools like selenium those are taught to them 
and alongside this uh, we are covering uh, aspects of continuous integration and continuous delivery where we are doing jenkins and uh, in containerization we are doing docker and orchestration we are using doing kubernetes we also go on to teach them uh, serverless that is aws lambda and those kind of technologies and uh, uh, finally we top it up with uh, uh, what is called as system provisioning and configuration management where we teach them about uh, tools like infrastructure as code like terraform right so this is how we close this entire loop and uh, having said that there is another very important aspect that we do over here is that we do four projects with our students which are in semester 5 6 7 and 8 and seventh semester is the time when our students are hit by the recruiter so that is the time by by the time they would have already gone to gone through two or three projects already so this is how we structure this whole program of course there is an industry internship in midway and similarly when it comes to artificial intelligence and machine learning we are doing tensor flow what you just suggested we are doing supervised learning unsupervised learning as separate subjects you know and we do two or three iterations of that and we also do certain aspects of cognitive thinking natural language processing so these are various aspects of artificial intelligence and machine learning and there are various use cases in industry like telecom or banking or healthcare so these are also covered it's not that only algorithmic thinking and algorithmic implementation is being covered the there are certain use cases which are also part of our curriculum and all these specialization subjects that we teach manav for this the content and the curation is provided by our industry partners like for example in devops our industry partner is zebia which happens to be in the magic quadrant of devops you know they are founder they are among the founders of dasa which is a key organization that manages devops world so so uh, that is the significance they have that is why we are partner with them and same way of course everybody is doing artificial intelligence but uh, ibm is our chosen partner because of the watson project that they have been indulging into and they have got a lot of in how in their labs and that in that whole ecosystem that is belonging to the labs that is brought to this manam now having said that uh, and thanks for that question i guess that will give a lot of uh, idea to the listeners also that how we structure our program uh, for them uh, there are uh, Uh, there are certain opportunities which has uh, come up due to covid uh, which then which present themselves for inside the it world it's not that uh, covid is only a challenge it has also brought in some opportunities so would you shed some light on the available opportunities in the various technology areas that you think of like blockchain or iot or other technologies and all, also i would like you to uh, help us understand that how should student prepare themselves for those the opportunities which are lying ahead due to this covid situation yeah i think the uh, the the question there is one first of all uh, as as we have talked about right uh, it is not just hey i know everything yeah people uh, students should pick and choose what what area they want to specialize in right i think uh, we already talked about this is this is whether you want to pick devops or whether you want to uh, pick machine learning or whether you want to pick framework development that is whether on the front end or whether you want to pick up scalability as a as a part of uh, as a part of learning when you're in college you should figure out what interests you the most yeah so pick that area up and then the in, the internships that you look for i think uh, with covid more and more uh, companies are going to offer virtual internships as well right it's not on site uh, it's not on site that we uh, it's not going to be the old model where internships are only offered hey you join a company they allow you to introduce uh, they introduce you to uh, some internal projects that you hone your skills on uh, our organization and i know uh, a lot of other organizations for example linkedin google uh, aw uh, amazon these guys are offering virtual internships focus on getting uh, th- those virtual internships and that goes back to remote model of development yeah so 
the opportunities are because of virtual internships there there are going to be a lot more opportunities that can be created because earlier people might have been uh, hampered by hey we do not have space to host x number of interns uh, uh, that that problem goes away yeah so that's number one uh, using uh, this covid situation to your advantage is gain uh both hard skills and soft skills as a part of that when uh align yourself uh align your uh program and see how it fits into what do you want to do right once you graduate i think that is uh that is the key i think the other uh thing is with 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 covid situation there is going to be acceleration towards digitization a, a lot more uh but there is going to be also a bit of slow down uh, at least for the next 6 months uh so be patient uh, with the slower processes right build your own online presence as we talked about uh, uh whether that is open source uh, contribution you know uh, build your linkedin profile uh reach out to folks uh ping ping directors and vps that hey you are graduating uh, on linkedin reach out uh on on social media specifically uh specifically linkedin uh which is which is the model for, uh, in which uh, students that are graduating are trying to build their own relationships they're not just leaning on their colleges or universities uh to be able to make uh to create opportunities so that is what i see monith uh, in the post covid uh situation where there are a lot of opportunities that are going to be virtual and remote so going back to going back to uh, what are the skill sets that are needed uh and uh, what your organization uh is offering i think that that is very relevant to to where the industry is going so so i think it is in line with what the industry expects and uh, i'm glad to hear some of the courses that you guys are offering are in line with uh the trends in the industry yeah thank you so much uh manav so now uh you know with this uh covid situation lots of uh, facilitation is happening from online courses like moocs have really come to fore it's not that yeah. they were not there they were there and it was for uh, all of us to uh, see and um, you know uh, and we were using and our students were also using them mm. now how do you see this moocs coming to fore for later learnings of for students of it and also what do the students do or to utilize the skills uh, uh, or the learning that they make out of this massive uh, massive online courses you know uh, we we have a tie up with uh, with coursera and edx and we offer all the 4000 odd courses which are available on coursera and all, as well as on edx whatever the number they offer we, all of those courses are available to all our students right and they are they have really taken uh, le- learning to a new level like you said learning level stops so they have actually demonstrated that also right now so what what uh, how do you see moocs affecting uh, education uh, per se and technical education for, for that matter in specific to it uh, how it is going to affect the it education in future and how do students make some worth out of the learnings that they make uh, through uh, moocs yeah excellent question uh, i think uh... Uh, the 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 learning and online learning specifically uh there's no better advocate than bill gates for it i think when he funded khan academy to be able to uh, generate a lot of content such that uh, s- students of uh, any age can go in and learn online i think uh he he already had put his stamp on or blessing on uh, the online learning platforms uh specific id i think uh, you already mentioned coursera there are others uh, udemy and uh, 
uh, other online platforms that are offering more and more online courses. Uh, I think they are offering at least uh, relative to the US terms, these courses are very, very discounted. Uh, you, you can get any course on any subject for less than $10. $10. That is both uh, uh, going, that is essentially transforming the industry. Uh, now, how do you, this again, keep, keep, keep going, going, going back to learning, just uh, taking a course does not uh, mean that you know something very, very well. Figure out uh, whatever you have learned, whether that is an AIML course, whether that is a DevOps course, whether that is uh, that is a scaling course, whether that is a data structure course, figure out how, whatever you have learned, how can you start and contributing to an open source project? Or figure out how do you wanna uh, solve, not just an open source project that is out there, build your own open source project based upon, based upon the problems that you see in your daily life. The one thing that folks need to realize is, IT is a technology en enabler to be able to solve the real problems that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it is both efficiency creation, it is both, uh, uh, and secondly, it is also solving, uh, uh, making things that were mundane uh, and automate them, ease of use, right? And it is not necessary that you have to uh, you have to look at look at what is the industry offering me as a job, uh, but create your own uh, projects which can solve real world problems. Uh, that is what I would say people should focus on, uh, not just contributing to stuff that is out there. Uh, but whatever you learned as part of your online learning, how do you make that useful and convert that into a project that is solving real world problems that will, that actually, uh, that actually creates a full circle of learning, uh, struggling and implement, trying to implement and so solve a world problem. And again, uh, contributing to the society. I think those are the three pillars uh, that online online learning and the way you can round your experience up. That is That would be my recommendation. Okay. Thank you so much. So Manav, uh, it was a really fruitful discussion with you. I mean, last 40 minutes that you gave us, it has given a lots of insight uh, with regards to significance of the programs that you are offering and it will also give a lot of insight to the listeners who are listening right now to us. So now uh, I guess it is time to take some questions. So I will request the participants to please keep on typing their questions. So now there is an anonymous question, Mano, where the person has asked this that, will there be a rise in data science jobs during this situation or post COVID? So would you like to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. Good question. I think there, there is already a rise in uh, there is already a big, huge rise in any technology that you use. You take Google Photos, right? They already use AIML, uh, banking sector, uh, telecom, any, you talk about any sector, uh, machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we talk about supervised, non-supervised uh, learning, uh, journalistic learning. Uh, that's another area where which we didn't probably touch on uh, for example there were very specific things like uh, ibm made watson uh, to play chess uh, or deep blue to uh, play chess and uh, it could only play chess now when you talk about our actual artificial intelligence oh can the same uh, deep blue be uh, uh, be able to learn on its own and play go uh, or go instead, right? So, so artificial intelligence is going to be uh, uh, the biggest trend in the industry for years to come. I think we are just scratching the surface right now. Uh, there's a long way for us to go. 
Okay, with this AI now uh, having explained so well by you, there is this new fad in town called as AI ops, data ops, Git ops. So we see a lot of ops over there. Can you shed some light on these fad terms because a lot of students they read about it on social media and they keep on asking us. Yeah, I, I think you can call it uh, you can call it whatever the heck you want, but the problem uh, problems related to uh, orchestration, right? I, I see if you talk about SRE, it is DevOps, it is orchestration, pipelines, uh, how do you uh, pushing go to production efficiency? We, uh, we call it, uh, uh, you know, this is all part of our uh, DevOps uh, organization. Second piece organization that, uh, and again, uh, in, I'm telling you what we at SAP, uh, what are the organizations that we have and uh, what do they translate? What the, what does the terminology translate to? So we have a DevOps and SRE organization that manages all this stuff um, of creating pipelines and uh, how do you push uh, stuff into production and they take, uh, take care of our scaling. SRE is another one that takes care of runtime reliability in production, performance, uh, scaling, uh, and uh, uh, bottlenecks in production, right? So, the, and then we have the third organization, which is, de uh, which is our developer organization, which is again made up of uh, UX and uh, uh, UX and backend. And the, the fourth organization that we have is related to data sciences, yeah? So, uh, and then we have, we have functional experts that know about the industry and all that kind of stuff. So though, if, if you ask me broadly uh, uh, and focus specifically on, on, on IT and, and the product company, those are the five or six organizations uh, that are relevant. You can call it any name you want. Every few months, there is a new name for, uh, that comes up. Yeah. Uh, now the sixth organization is product management, and that's a completely different uh, skill set uh, where you know uh, folks folks are actually uh, looking at industry industry trends. What are the competitors doing? Um, so those are the six or seven broad organizations in product development, and you can each each one has its own set of verticals uh, within them. Fine. Uh, thank you so much. That helps. Uh, I guess a lot of light would have been shed on that. There is something fundamental on which where uh, lots of other things start taking over and the terminologies, they keep on changing. But at the end, it is more about fundamental things, which are very, very important. So uh, there is this question by one of the attendees, Manav, where uh, Hansika, uh, she has asked that, IoT is going to be helpful in medical sector as well, but uh, uh, there are there is a, not so much of trust when it comes to these kind of applications for healthcare. So, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, interesting question. IoT is essentially uh, putting sensors and getting data from that and figuring that out. I think the more data that you have, the better it is. I'm not too sure why they're uh, I think the IoT sector is still evolving. It is not as if we, uh, there aren't, it all depends upon what are the things that you use on a day-to-day -day basis? Are they already plugged in and are they already communicating and giving you feedback? For example, in the US, you have uh, IoT fridges that are coming. It'll tell you, uh, you're out of milk. You, uh, you need to go, purchase XYZ grocery, and it can already uh, uh, communicate with Amazon and procure those products for you. So every date is making your life more and more easier. Uh, the, uh, the question was specific to the medical industry, uh, Apple, for example, whatever it is doing, right? It has already in the Apple watch, you already see uh, things like uh, uh, blood, pre blood pressure monitors, you already see things like uh, it, 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 it gives you the ability on doing ECGs. Uh, uh, it, it, it 
it also tells you tells you about your sleep cycles and all that kind of stuff so this is still nascent uh, i don't think it is uh, uh, the ecg for example measurement is approved by fda but can that be used uh, on its own without uh, without seeking advice from a doctor i don't think we are there yet but i think uh, there are going to be a few more iterations that need to happen before each and every person uh, can start trusting the data that we're getting from such devices yeah. but i think we 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 are just scratching the surface in healthcare on hmm. what iot uh, devices can give you and uh, i think Uh, this is this is going to transform the industry in the next 5 years thank you so much manav and that was a very uh, crisp answer to a very complex question uh now uh there is this question by one of the attendees where the person is asked is that will the need of cyber security as a discipline in it its need would arise post covid because there is a lot of emphasis on digitization that is we are we are right now realizes realizing for the students so sorry can you repeat that question i i miss, uh, miss the specific question is will there be rise in cyber security or information security during the post covid times so uh it is not just a security is not just a post covid question in my opinion uh security was always a bi- really big topic uh i think the if you if you look at the industry in the last 5 years uh there is there is a c level uh, uh positions that have been created they are called ciso chief information security officers the 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 trust and the safety office uh is big let me give you a few examples of that uh you look at facebook the ceo had to go to congress uh to be able to say hey what are you doing uh, stuff about fake news hey what are you doing it's not about just hey uh stopping phishing attacks uh, it is about how do you Uh, security officers are how do you secure your platform not not just from phishing attacks and dos attacks and uh, other kind of uh, attacks it is about how do you protect the information how do you make the platform more reliable such that trust is created between the consumer and the provider so cso uh, and th- so that is from a consumer standpoint internally there are uh, uh who has we talked about ai ml so from various data sources data is getting pushed into data lakes and who has access to that data how are they using that data uh, that becomes really really uh, uh, relevant uh, who has the information how are they accessing it what are they accessing the information for, uh, for? uh i think this is one of the uh, one of the biggest fields that is going to uh, you're going to see similar to ai ml i see that that is another industry uh, pillar that is going to you're going to see see exponential growth uh, uh, in in the demand for those kind of folks okay so um i think we are now coming to end of uh, if uh, listeners want to ask any questions again i'm still scrolling through the questions to find the relevant one so uh there is this one very interesting question that how much there is scope of ai in india currently so uh, i would rather like to take that question you know sure uh, yeah uh, see just try to understand that artificial intelligence is a discipline which is not suddenly come and hit us uh what was a research area 10 years down the line it has now particularly eased out because of the various available uh, technologies which are there uh, uh, just off the shelf you can take uh, pull in I, uh, ai into your existing problem but the thing is that uh, uh, we need to understand the it landscape uh, of indian products and services markets uh, major of the majority of the software that we produce in india it is exported to foreign clients no 
of course it is being consumed in india but we are a top exporter when it comes to software as a country we all should understand and appreciate that and since ai wave has hit all pieces of software so it and like i said artificial intelligence uh, pieces or the technologies that provide you artificial intelligence inside your software those are available to us over the shelf i mean but you need to understand where they lie and there is a complete piece around it i mean you need to understand what cloud is what is how where on what platform what kind of artificial intelligence algorithm is available and how to loop it in so there are certain other skills also and of course uh, at the heart of it is a lot of mathematics and algorithm algorithms which you need to understand so uh, so there is a lot of scope of artificial intelligence in india currently so we need to be um, we need to be very very sure about it and there is no nothing that you need to doubt uh, regarding um, artificial intelligence as a having a potential uh, so i guess uh, we are more or less done with the uh, webinar and uh, manav thank you so much uh, for uh, such an engaging discussion and a fruitful discussion i'm sure uh, the listeners would have benefited from these uh, um, the answers and the comments that you made and the insights you provided around uh, the whole it landscape that comprises of artificial intelligence devops big data pipelines site reliability engineering scaling cloud and other other aspects and yes of course uh, uh, general advice to all the students that manav has given is that you need to focus on csc program that offer you uh, in terms of content uh, various problem solving aspects like uh, data structures algorithm which of course part are, are part of our curriculum as well as you need to look at the program from a soft skill perspective also which we are offering to our students alongside the specialization all the specialization that uh, manav has mentioned i must say that we are already running programs in all those those specializations and listeners can definitely consider those programs and uh, manav thank you once again we really appreciate at ups you having taken this time and i understand it is very very early in the morning when uh, we started this webinar over there but i'm sure you are early riser so you could make it up uh, and thank you all right thank you monit thank you for having me as well it was a very interesting topic uh, so couldn't stay away uh, it is interesting to know that your university is offering a lot of uh, courses that uh, the, and on the topics that we touched and discussed on so uh, wish you as well as your incoming students uh, good luck uh, for the current year and uh, wish best wishes to your students who are graduating this year in the search uh, for jobs as well good luck thank you so much thanks once again right. thank you bye bye bye